Welcome everyone and in many cases welcome back as Emma says we continue today with our third session in Solent University's professorial lecture series for 2021 and I'm Caroline Walsh, Director Solent Business School and I'm delighted to be introducing our next, our next lecture by Professor Gillian Farker who is Professor of Management Research within Solent Business School. This afternoon Gillian will take us on a journey of reflection celebration and learning through her own research stories and the inspiration and community that have helped Professor Parker to nurture and support the work. Uh, the work is never easy and we all know how vital a community of practice and a culture is to sustain and develop impactful research and knowledge exchange. Something we are committed to develop and grow and support at Solent University as our 2025 university strategy makes clear. Professor Gillian Farker has managed to sustain and develop a huge body of work over more than 25 years in higher education and the work covers a range of interests across management and marketing with internationally recognized research on the marketing of financial services, management research methods, corporate social responsibility and banking, crisis management, corporate brand recovery, entrepreneurship and social networking. Professor Parker has experience of working in a variety of institutions, starting at Northampton University, University of Bedfordshire, Oxford Brookes, and London Metropolitan. She is research fellow at the Gordon Institute of Business Science at the University of Pretoria, South Africa, and also senior associate for the Center of Risk, Banking, and Financial Services at the University of Nottingham. Gillian has published in numerous high-ranking peer-reviewed journals, won awards and funding, written books and chapters, presented at conferences and also supported and supervised many doctoral students to successful completion. And very importantly, she still continues to do all of this. I distinctly recall meeting Gillian at the Academy of Marketing Conference on Marketing Dimensions held at Bournemouth in 2014. I was presenting on student segmentation clusters and Gillian presented on rigor in case study research. It was clear to me from the get-go that Gillian is passionate about research and preparing students for professional life. She is fiercely intelligent and very direct, which is refreshing. We little thought that seven years on, we would both find ourselves still on the South Coast, working together for Solent University as part of our newly launched Solent Business School. But I, for one, am very glad we are. We can all learn a lot from Gillian's journey and her experience. So it's with real pleasure and enthusiasm I introduce and hand over to Professor Gillian Farker to tell us more about her chair and other stories. Caroline, thank you so much for such a glowing introduction. How on earth do I live up to that? Well, I'm not even going to try. Um, thank you again, everybody, for asking me to do this. It's a real honour and privilege to uh, be doing this this afternoon. Um, although uh, it would be nicer to be doing it in person. Um, that is life. Um, I've worked in mainly new universities, as Caroline has enumerated. Um, I'm so old now, I can even add another one, um, which was Manchester Metropolitan. And since two of my mentors, um, who were so influential in my early career, were based there at the time, um, I feel that it does get an honorable mention. But I did have a different name then, so um, I can understand um, why uh, that probably got lost in translation. So we're looking at a picture of a wonderfully chatty chair. I mean, look at it, the stuffing's coming out. Um, and even when I got that chair, it wasn't new. Um, and it was a throw out from one of the institutions that I was working at at the time. Nonetheless, it was immensely comfortable. And just as I was throwing it out, getting it ready for um, the uh, collectors in Oxford to, to pick up, I suddenly stopped and looked at it and I thought, my goodness gracious me, that chair and I have had a long association and it has sustained me through an awful lot of research. And so that got me thinking about all the other ways in which I have been sustained and supported through my research. In addition to the two mentors um, whom I encountered very early in my career and to whom I owe a great deal, um, the chair, my family, my friends, my colleagues, all contribute to um, what I do. 
and I think it's very important as well that I try and put back into um, academic life a little of, of, of what I've been able to achieve. I'm something of a late starter to this life. Um, I could almost style myself as an accidental academic, but very early on, I got involved in this research lark. Lark, hmm, that's not quite the right word, but certainly I embrace research. I like the whys, the hows, the whos, and all the intricacy of meeting a particular piece of work together and, 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 and how that work ultimately will make a contribution. As Caroline has said, there's been a couple of books on the way, um, Marketing and Financial Services and Case Study Research, um, lots of book chapters, um, which people have asked me to do, and also the pain of research papers. I'll share a little bit of that pain as we progress through um, my uh, talk this afternoon, but it, it can, can be quite a painful process. And so that is why you need, I think, the support of your networks and your friends and your family in, in working through that particular, it can be something of an ordeal um, in, in getting your work published. Um, could we move on to slide two, please? Um, you'll be seeing quite a bit of this slide because I've really structured the whole of my chat um, around it. Um, rather, I suppose, like you do um, um, figure in your research. Marketing and financial services, I suppose if, if I was known for anything, it would be marketing and financial services. Um, Again, something of an accident. I was working where there was a particular cluster of building societies um, and uh, they supported my research and uh, in, in a number of different ways. And so I kind of kept on that track. Um, I've edited the International Journal of Bank Marketing over my time. Uh, you can see a front cover of my book down at the bottom, which I wrote with Arthur Leiden. And um, I'm, I'm still, still researching in that field. And I thought today, probably the, one of the most useful ways I could structure this talk and illustrate how important this notion of support and sustaining is, is by talking about various papers. So one of the financial services papers that has just been published just right at the beginning of this year um, is on the topic of corporate brand recovery. Now, it didn't start out that way. And I think that to share with you how a paper evolves is really probably quite important. Um, it started out as an investigation into brand identity. And it was responding to a call, a call for papers for a special issue of a well-respected journal. So we crafted a paper around uh, a case study, more of which later, on, on brand identity. <clears throat> However, we got rejected. So as you do, you sort of go, <sighs> and you put it all aside, and then you come back. Um, and so I started to look at the data, having uh, learned over the years and been told by various people that uh, you know, listen to your data. So I started to read the data very carefully. Um, the data were <clears throat> um, managerial interviews, informant interviews from um, insurance, um, the insurance world. Um, this is my long-suffering co-author um, uh, is excellent at, at, at getting data from her, her, her contacts. Um, and the data really were talking about how they were recovering the brand within the context of um, the 2008 global financial services crash. Um, so from this, 
it began, we began to, to, to craft a paper along the notion of, of brand recovery. And it became quite clear from the literature that there was something of um, <laughs> a gap, the gap, a gap in the literature about service recovery, about um, corporate brand recovery. Much of the existing work um, was about um, brand um, recovering a, a, a product brand and uh, recovering um, a food, often food brands. Um, and it was about brand warranties. I've written quite a bit about stakeholder branding. So by weaving together a number of different themes, we were able to build, develop a construct of corporate brand recovery. Um, this takes time. I mean, this paper was many years in gestation, um, but we submitted it to um, a journal which about which we've given a great deal of thought. Um, this particular journal um, is well ranked. Um, it publishes work on uh, marketing management as well as consumer research. So it bridges um, an important aspect of marketing, important aspects of marketing. Um, and so um, having thought about it very carefully, I mean, there was a lot of, lot of work. Um, fortunately, my colleague and I are well used to working with each other and, and we bring different things. It's, it's a good, good, good uh, relationship. We submitted it and we were very lucky. We had good reviewers. We had three reviewers who are very knowledgeable about the field, both the methodology and the subject matter. Um, one of them, I think, was a real corporate brand expert, but nonetheless, they like the paper. And really, that's what this is all about. If your reviewers like the paper, then you're in a good position to be able to move forward. That didn't in any way reduce the amount of revisions that we had to do. We had two full revisions and also the um, associate editor of the journal uh, had quite a bit to say about um, our revision. So effectively we had, we had four reviewers. Nonetheless, oh yes, and one of the reviewers, um, and this was an omission, but it was so, so helpful. And this is where the reviewing process, I think can be so helpful and supportive is um, they said, well, you don't mention anything, you're talking about a branding crisis or an industry crisis, but you don't mention anything about crisis management. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, golly, oh, what an omission, how silly, but that's what reviewers do. So we consulted the crisis management literature um, and uh, widened the scope of the paper to include uh, crisis management. Roughly about that time, I also had a request from a friend of mine um, at the National Ocean University in Taiwan um, to collaborate with him on a paper about airline crisis management. So I was able to write back to him and say, well, actually, I know a bit about this at the moment, so I can help you with this quite, quite, quite well. Uh, that paper actually um, was published in the interim. So that's really nice. It's almost, no, I'm not even going to say two for the price of one, but it was helpful that I did have that literature and I knew that literature. So um, corporate brand recovery has appeared um, just at the beginning of this year, um, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, as far as other activities with the marketing and financial services are concerned. I am co-editing two special issues of the International Journal of Marketing. Um, I don't edit it full time anymore, um, but I do do the odd special issue. Um, one is on Sub-Saharan Africa, um, which I'm, I'm very excited about, um, but that's as a result of my contacts with, at Gibbs. And uh, the second one is on artificial intelligence. And that has come through one of my former PhD students who is doing really, really well at the moment. But isn't that nice when a student gets in touch with you and says, will you work with us on this? So uh, that's very exciting as well. 
Um, so lots to do, as Caroline says, I'm, I'm not exactly putting my feet up. The second strand of research that um, I'm talking about today um, is my engagement with qualitative research methods. I don't think that you can be a researcher these days without being really engaged with research methods. It can get pretty heated, I have got to say. I do remember um, a rather <clears throat> uh, strenuous debate at one of the um, American conferences I was at um, amongst uh, some uh, colleagues on various statistical techniques. Um, as a qualitative research person, I don't really get into that, but um, equally well, um, there are certain protocols that I would always argue are part or part and parcel of, of getting published in qualitative research. I, I got involved in this, and again, I owe this to uh, a, another friend of mine, a mate um, who I've known for many years. We were sitting uh, working with a very good PhD student, and I had really sort of, I was just giving my, this PhD student some, some feedback on her methodology chapter. And my friend said, who I think is, is wonderful, she said, oh, she said, I'm really impressed by what you've said there, that's really good. And you know, that's, that's so long ago, and I remembered that. Um, and I thought, oh, yes, actually, I really quite enjoy doing this. So I got involved with teaching qualitative research methods to master's students, as well as undergraduate students. And I realized that um, for these master students and for the MBA students, there wasn't a text that was suitable for them to help them with their dissertations. Um, a lot of the MSc students and the MBA students had been working. They had data and access to data from the organizations for whom they had worked, or in some cases were continuing to work. And what they lacked at that time was um, a fairly accessible text, which told them how best to present um, a single or multiple case study investigation. So um, I, approached SAGE um, and um, put together a book on case study research methods for business. And um, that was some time ago, but um, it was hard work. Writing a book is extremely hard work, but it, 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 it was fun. And it really sort of cemented my relationship with, with uh, research methods. I must add at this point that case study research doesn't need to be qualitative research, it can be both. But most of the time it is qualitative research, at least it is in marketing. Um, from this book, there were two big areas, two areas which I thought needed much deeper investigation. The first one is um, how do you select your cases? And the second one is this notion of triangulation. Uh, the first area, case study selection, is, is still um, a work in progress. Um, it's actually got really quite involved and is making my head hurt at the moment. Triangulation, um, again, I started to work on that when I was in Italy, um, working at the University of Salerno, and you can see um, there, uh, yeah, it's, it's probably on the next slide. Spent three glorious months working in South, Southern Italy. Um, it's a tough life. And it, I, I was working on this triangulation uh, notion. Triangulation, as you will realize, is um, getting a fix on a particular point from two on, on, on a measurement using two particular sources of measurement. Um, it figures in triangulation because um, what you're trying to argue is that uh, your various sources of data uh, corroborate or converge on a particular truth. Now, from an epistemological perspective, 
this notion of truth is um, questionable. And as the more I read about triangulation, the more I realized that it was confused, that you had a number of different streams of triangulation coming into case study research, which rather than illuminating uh, the whole area, were in fact muddy in the waters in no small way. So I got to grips with the whole issue of triangulation. I embedded it within qualitative, within qualitative case studies and within marketing. Marketing's not been a great fan of case study research over the years. I think that tide is changing and has changed, I think, probably already. Um, but uh, there are certain journals now which really don't consider case study research to be um, uh, as robust, shall we say, as, as other forms of research. Well, um, we could argue about that quite a lot. However, so I had the groundwork for this triangulation paper and uh, working on the basis that it's foolish to do this alone, I involved a couple of my long-suffering colleagues and um, we crafted this paper. We drew very heavily on uh, the multi-method multi literature, which um, used triangulation quite a lot. Um, we argued for a contribution to marketing research. And after very careful reflection, went for a journal that publishes quite a lot of case study research. Um, and case study research actually figures in quite a lot of the business to business marketing literature. Um, and so we went for the uh, highest rank journal, why not, in, in that particular domain, industrial marketing management. When you do a conceptual paper, and this was a conceptual paper, i.e. there were no data, um, I think it's very important that you pay attention to um, grounding your propositions in some form of evidence. And this was something I'd seen in a paper a few years ago, and I do this all the time when I'm writing a conceptual paper, is show what, what I'm proposing or, or drawing evidence, drawing evidence between what has been already published. So we analyzed 10 published papers that used triangulation um, and uh, were able to illustrate our points with reference to these papers. Uh, we also included a table about the different types of triangulation um, and also created a um, figure which summarized our findings. I believe very strongly, and I always tell my PhD students, that <clears throat> reviewers and examiners uh, really appreciate summary tables um, um, and, and, and conceptual drawings because it shows them that you have really grasped some of the intellectual issues that you are writing about. So again, uh, submitted the paper. We had three reviewers, um, two of whom were pretty favorable. The third one um, had quite a lot to say. However, again, after two major revisions, we were successful and that paper was published um, last year. I think we've got to say, I think all of us were really rather pleased with that because to get a research methods paper published in a top journal, well, I'm pretty pleased anyway. The third element of uh, my um, talk today is something called eclectic research. Um, all these research um, strands are running uh, at the same time. Um, is this a good thing? I don't know, but it's the way that, that, that things have panned out. And again, this is down to my fab friends and mates. The first 
bit of research under eclectic research <clears throat> um, really started with a paper that my long suffering colleague uh, invited me to work on with her, which was on the subject of student debt. Um, they'd done um, a survey of um, undergraduate students and their attitudes towards debt. Um, and um, they just just asked me in to sort of uh, just just sort of um, probably just chop and tail. Um, and that that paper's been published, and in fact is part of my referentiary for, for Soland. Um, I got very involved in in all of this. I, I don't know how you can't get involved in, in research. It's just just so interesting. Um, and this whole notion of indebtedness. And listening to the conversation that we had yesterday um, with um, Tiamantek, um, I think that this notion of indebtedness is one I'd like to pursue with, with a view to, to public engagement. Um, and at the same time, I was also um, asked to work with uh, another colleague of mine and her colleague up in Northumbria um, to uh, work on payday lending. Now, I think many of us are aware of, pay of payday lending, and uh, this uh, particular colleague of mine had done an excellent piece of work on um, uh, the experiences, the phenomenological, the, the experiences of payday borrowers. And she had collected data using a phenomen phenomenological approach uh, on their experience with uh, payday lenders um, and borrowing, not so much their experience with payday lenders, but being in debt. Um, and we've we've got uh, we've had one we've got we've resubmitted not resubmitted we've revised and resubmitted again to a, a very good journal um, about that work on that work um, and. Um, hoping for great things. It's, it's a, a very, a very, very interesting um, study. It also takes me into a domain with which I am not particularly familiar because the work up till now that I've been doing has always been um, marketing strategy. So I've now crossed the divide or crossed the bridge into consumer research. Um, and uh, it's a whole new world in no small way. Quite coincidentally, um, on Twitter, I have met a, uh, an American professor or a professor working in an American university who's looking at uh, financial literacy amongst black students. So um, this, this promises to be a very um, enriching stream of work. Um, and um, I'm very excited about it. The second stream is um, to do with uh, women entrepreneur. And again, I've, uh, there's a couple of uh, ways in which uh, opposing uh, sources for this. One was um, an invitation from a friend of mine who lives and works in France. Um, and she and her colleague had collected some data on um, women micro entrepreneur in Lebanon. Um, and uh, the data were fantastic, and they were also collected in an extremely innovative way by using WhatsApp. So we uh, wrote up this paper. Um, and Caroline made mention to this about social networking. Um, it was written on the basis of a contribution to qualitative research methods uh, for a well-regarded journal in that field. Um, and um, actually looking at those data from a different perspective um, and uh, working with those same colleagues again, although in fact I brought in another couple of uh, colleagues of mine, a friend and a new young researcher who is from um, not Lebanon, but she's from Palestine and has experience with uh, entrepreneurship within conflict zones. Um, so very interesting field of research. And at the same time, one of my colleagues at Solent, um, Dr. Wisni Anti Bazuki, also invited me to work with her on um, 
women entrepreneurs locally uh, to the air and, and how they are encountering difficulties in growing their business through um, a lack of funding. So um, we are analyzing these data at the moment and um, certainly we will be writing these data up both probably for uh, reports and for um, publication in uh, journals. I will also uh, plug um, uh, Liz Nianti's work. She's uh, presented on Monday um, in two different fora, uh, the details of which I'm sure will be shared with you. So um, is it spinning plates, I wonder, or is that an alternative topic? Yes, certainly I've got my work in financial services, uh, my qualitative research methods work, and my eclectic research. Of course, there are overlaps between all three of them, so it's not, they're not separate. Um, they, they, they interweave and um, each one of them support each other. There are the three areas underneath as well, um, PhD supervision, I think I've already alluded to uh, at least one of my former PhD students, but in fact, I work with more than one. I'm working with um, another one um, on our paper for the um, Sub-Saharan Africa a special issue of the IJBM. Um, publications, well, in an ideal world, of course, you, you publish with your PhD students, but it doesn't always work like that. Many of us do our own publications as well. Um, and that's that, as I said, I really get a buzz out of putting um, a piece of work together. It does feel like knitting sometimes. And then, of course, there's always the uh, additional and increasingly important burden of deriving funding uh, for your work and um, how that work um, supports knowledge exchange. Um, I've raised quite a bit of money over the years, but it's getting tougher all the time. I've also done um, KTP, Knowledge Transfer Partnerships, um, with institutions as well, so that it's always very nice to see how your academic research informs business. But that, that continues now, and um, having been at the workshop yesterday where we were talking about public engagement, uh, that is only going to become even more important. So, to return to the chair, well, that chair isn't with me anymore. It went to the dump in Oxford. I hope somebody's looking after it now, because you can see it was pretty tatty. Looked tatty, but was surprisingly comfortable. I have been sustained through my research by my mates, my colleagues, my family, my friends, even my friends who aren't in the academic world will listen to me whilst I blether on about my research. Um, my long suffering co-authors who put up with me eternally fiddling with a piece of work. I would like to thank the reviewers. Recently, we just had wonderful reviewers, not because they've agreed or liked my work, but because they have framed their comments so supportively and so helpfully. Um, I've got one reviewer at the moment who really doesn't like what I've done, but hey, one out of 10 or 12 recently, that's not so bad. I can cope with that. And anyway, that's part of the job. I would also like to think, thank conference organisers because they do a huge job. And I think we're all missing conferences in real life at the moment um, and certainly can't wait to go to uh, the next Academy of Marketing Conference in Huddersfield uh, in 2022, where it will be just wonderful to meet up with all my colleagues again. Um, I've also learned a great deal through conference workshop participants who really stop and make you reflect upon your work. So looking ahead and looking back at the same time, bit of James there, um, persevere. It's all about perseverance. It's all about getting up and dusting yourself off and, and addressing uh, those comments, um, dealing with rejections. I've had plenty of those, believe me. I think the days of crushing reviews are nearly over, at least they should be. Um, 
That's not the job of the reviewer. The job of the reviewer is to see what is good in the paper and to try and strengthen it. At least that's what I always try and do. I think my message is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Don't try and work on your own. There's too much to do. The expectations of funding committees, of, of, of uh, editors, and um, everybody else in the game. Um, really, you need somebody who you, who you can work with. At the same time, please get writing. If you have an idea, get it down on paper. But before you progress too far, trot along to somebody who you think might know a little bit about it or somebody you respect and say, what do you think of this? I was, um, I played a lot of team sport over the years um, and a good team player is somebody who turns up, does what's expected of them and, and on time. You don't have to be the best player on the pitch. You don't have to be the star. It's all about completing, finishing, and you do get better at it. You know how to frame a contribution. You know how to create a table. You know how to present your work well. These are things that you learn on the way, and you can shorten your learning time considerably by working with people who've got a bit more experience. So get writing, be a team player, and brace yourself for tough times ahead. And I wish I could be more optimistic, but I'm not feeling that quite at the moment. I would like to thank everybody who's helped me put this presentation together. I would like to thank everybody at Solent for welcoming me, for Caroline for saying nice things, and um, just thank you very much indeed for listening. Namaste. Thank you, Gillian. That's uh, really, really interesting. And I, I love the fact that you have these three streams of activities. And in a way, um, I'm just going to kick off. There are some questions coming in, but also to give people time to, to type in as well. I just wanted to, to reflect on the length of time it takes to publish a paper in a high ranking journal. And that's an interesting uh, aspect and probably something that means that you probably have to have more than one thing on the go is is that your experience or how would you how would you think about that uh, if you were to describe sort of the stages of what you've got on the go what would be ideal given given that sort of scenario of time oh i i, I think we're not talking about ideals um, <laughs> talking about how how you cope um I did read on Twitter fairly recently uh, a post from um, a tweet from a, a much uh, respected colleague who works um, in uh, not, not very far away actually from Solo. And he was saying that actually he, <laughs> the paper that they just published had been, in, had been around for about 10 years. Mm. Um, but at the same time, he's just published a book, uh, second issue, second edition of a book. And uh, he's also, I know fairly, fairly recently, also got a, a four-star paper out. So I think it is about uh, balls in the air. I think it is about spinning plates. Um, I think one positive thing is that, I, I, I've just mentioned this, is that there is overlap. So um, also, and, and underneath all of that is, I think I said to you the other day, it's about you know what a good PhD looks like, and you probably have a fairly good idea of what a good paper looks like. You know, you do have certain expectations. So um, there, is, there is that. Um, but if you are in the position, I try never to turn down any office. Let's just say it like that. <laughs> Seize the opportunities. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be cagey. <laughs> <laughs> Seize the opportunities as they come up and, uh, yes, and try and push. About the timelines as well. So um, I sometimes get somebody coming in and saying, oh, oh and I say, well, look, I, I really can't do that just at the moment. This is what I can do. And, and it's always, you know, weeks ahead. You can't, I don't drop everything. I have commitments to other people. So, you know, 
be honest, be fair, and you know, again, it's that team play. You've got that position, and that's your position on the pitch. Keep it. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you so much, Gillian, for you know sharing that insight and the range of things that you're involved in and the way you've worked, as you say, very much uh, as a team player with, and within a team and within a group of a, of a variety of people who've sustained you. And I think that is really important that I think being part of that group and, and having more than one thing probably on the go because you'll reach certain block points and you'll need to switch between things. So that, that sounds good. We have some questions coming through. So if I could just ask you, um, this is from, uh, from Darren, um, Darren Kurt, who's um, uh, actually strategic research lead for the faculty. He's asking, Gillian, in your experience and field, did the 2008 crash produce any notable changes to research practices or research methodologies? Um, I had to rewrite my book. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, no, I think I can, I can say, Darren, no, um, it didn't. And I wish I could say that it had resulted in changes to the way that banks behave. And I'll read to that. Um, Darren um, and I know, both know um, Stoke on Trent, and you will remember Britannia. I'm sure Britannia Building Society, who were tremendously helpful to me, and um, I think um, we can um, we can probably assume, that Darren, that Britannia tried to play with the big boys and got thoroughly burnt and had to merge with the co-op and, um, and 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 have not been seen or heard of since. And that, I think that's a terrible shame. I have I carry a bit of a torch building societies. I bank with the building society now. Um, they, they, they may not be, no, they, they, they have a completely different system of governance, which is much more robust than some of these really big boys. Um, and, uh, and they are boys. Um, and um, I, just, I just get very cross. Well, I do. Uh, I think we all get cross with them because they really, really, really push the envelope. Um, and certainly retail customers are way down. They're, just, they're, they're playing other games. So, yeah. no, Darren, <laughs> I wish I could say I, very fertile ground for research, but certainly not, 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 not really influencing research methods, I think, in any significant way. Apart from my brilliant paper on trying diligence, which mentions nothing about financial services. That's interesting. I wonder if the uh, the current situation has had more impact, perhaps, um, in in people's approach to research. I don't know. You mentioned WhatsApp, WhatsApp, but that that might just be a technological innovation. Is there anything else that you've seen coming through uh, in that way? Um, there was a special issue fairly recently, and I didn't get the time to read it. Um, I think we're always looking at different ways of gathering data. What is probably also needs to be thought about um, is how you analyze those data, because for qualitative data, it's the analysis. And I wonder whether we need to be a little bit more um, borrowed from other disciplines. Now, Caroline, this is your excellent question. This is making me think on the spot, which is what I love. So, so if, we, if we looked at dance, or if we looked at performance, mm -hmm. I mean, it's marketing for goodness sake, how perhaps can we borrow from their methods in order for, to inform some of our research methods? Whoa, fancy writing a paper? Yeah, actually, that's amazing because I think that's one of the powerful things about Solent as well is that as a group, we're part, as you know, Solent Business School, but we're part of the Faculty of Business Law and Digital Technologies and we're part of a university with just three faculties. So we've actually got access to people from across the creative industries, engineering, um, digital technologies, health and social sciences. So we're in a, in a great area to be able to share really um, 
something that we we are doing and i think that is something to to definitely uh, pick up on across the piece and um richard um scullion here has observed that um in some way it uh, he's, he's 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 thinking about what you said and wondering if if pain is an apt way to capture some of the experiences um if, did i not mention that at the beginning the pain yes of <laughs> absolutely richard yes absolutely <laughs> Yes, and, it, it does, it does, yeah, no, I think, I think many of us would, would stick with that really because, you know, reviews are blind, reviews are blind, they don't know who you are, um, although sometimes you can make a bit of a guess, but it doesn't matter because um, it doesn't matter who's doing the right, well, I'm not best pleased by what this reviewer is saying about my paper in, in the IJBM at the moment, but I have to deal with it. You have to deal with it. So I think it's a way of sort of packaging that pain, wrapping some string and sellotape around it. And since I'm surrounded by bubble wrap because I've just moved, putting it in bubble wrap as well, and, 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 and learning to deal with that pain. It's not a personal attack. It's often to do with just, um, so for example, I get, I get a decision. I've had a decision this week. Um, and looking at reviewer two. I have no intention of dealing with reviewer two's comments this week. I need to <sighs> and get a bit of perspective, a little bit of distance and realizing that it's not a personal attack. He, she doesn't know who I am. I just need to take those words that are written on a piece of paper and deal with them. But um, certainly it did used to, it did used to be, it, until you get that distance, the, yes. the sweat, the sweat, and the and the and and uh, blood, sweat, and tears. Coin the phrase. Um, yes, but get up and walk about. Go and do something. I keep on sort of looking up to the left, and I apologise for doing that because in my new abode, I've got a a parkland walk, which is an old railway line, which is just up there, and um, I can see me using that a great deal. Mm. I've had enough. Stop me throwing things. <laughs> To be fair, Richard does say also, yes, it's about pain, but sometimes a bit of dread, but also some vulnerability, and then juxtaposed with a sense of wonder. And I think, I think that can be a payoff for the pain, perhaps. <laughs> oh well, as I said, if you if you poured so much effort into a paper, and you do have to do that these days, it's nothing you can't do it. It's not writing on the back of a fag packet. I have um, I have had. Um, some, some interesting discussions with, with, with colleagues, perhaps senior managers, perhaps who haven't been writing, and this of course is not, not at Solent, she says hastily, um, where they have not really understood the research process and think that writing a three-star paper can be accomplished really very quickly, which I'm afraid it can't. And that is now, uh, I mean, we talk about star papers, you know, and, and impact factors and all of this. You really can't write um, a paper quickly these days. Um, it's an iterative and prolonged process which requires a great deal of reflection and a great deal of thought. Um, I've got a few more questions, um, Gillian, so I better uh, crack sorry. on with those as well. Um, I, I guess what motivates you to keep doing what you are doing? Uh, which is from Lisa Devon. Thank you. I did say, um, uh, it, it, just as we were chatting beforehand, that um, I'm, I'm semi-retired these days, um, but um, uh, I used to go down the gym <laughs> quite a lot. Um, I'm a t I was a game player for many, many years. Um, no, but that's not actually, I'm, I'm, that's not true. I think it's quite nice to go down the gym and then to come back. And um, I still like, I, it's this knitting together. I keep using this analogy. I like putting these things together but then I like Latin at school so you know there's no hope for me really. <laughs> Good so uh, yeah as you say and um, um, Karen uh, has asked she's thanked you very much Karen thank you for the insightful presentation and asked what the university could do to support colleagues to develop their own research journeys so thank, thank you uh, this is Karen VC has asked this for you. Um, and you expect me to answer that? Yes, because I remember I've built you. I've built you a straight talking, um, uh, Julian. <laughs> uh, 
Well, Caroline and I were talking last earlier in the week about this, and, and I've, I've really been thinking a lot about what we said, and I think that it is this notion of collaboration and teamwork. Um, and I think we probably need to begin to embed that, um, knowing full well that we are working really within quite straitened circumstances. So, I mean, I'm not just going to snap back and say, more time, more money, because I know that we would make that available if it was. Notice how diplomatic I am in my old age. Um, I think it is about teamwork and, 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 and really there's tremendous strength and tremendous work willingness within most institutions. And I, and I sense this particularly as well at Solon and how we can, under the new structure, begin to foster a research culture. We have to have this research culture. You know the answer, you know the answer to your question. But I, I suppose it's articulating that. Wherever I've been, and I've been encouraging research over the years, it is that research culture. And by doing these guest lectures, I think that that is a, a, an important part of the process. And when we get back on campus, then it's about workshops, um, both on and offline, and sharing, sharing the pain, Richard, that's now going to go down in the annals, and, and sharing progress and sharing the good stories and the bad stories. Because a lot of what I think stops people publishing and writing is fear of rejection and I'm not good enough and the lack of confidence. Well, as I've always said to people in the business school, been there, done that, ask me. Mm. And not just me, there are others as well. There are plenty of others. Darren, who's an uh, established researcher and there's plenty more as well with me. We're all here, we're happy to help us and like a plus met out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, sort of following on from this, uh, Gillian Saevers, thank you very much. Um, and also talked about how interesting your paper on the Lebanese female entrepreneurs was with the WhatsApp data collection. And it's reflecting on your comments about um, reviewers and the importance of reviewers and wondering if to, it would be a good idea to, to become a reviewer if you can in order to, to to see that side is that you would recommend yes yes um, in fact actually um, as a special as a co-editor on this special issue um, I shall certainly be asking people with any insight into artificial intelligence to mm because uh, it's certainly uh, a new area for me and I don't know people. So those of you who are digitally um, uh, equipped, would you be kind enough? I should be getting in touch with you because we shall need that. Reviewers, re yes, it's a tremendously valuable learning process. Um, and I think that um, uh, going forward, it's a very, very good thing to do. I should, I should be on that. Thank you for reminding me about that. Yeah, I think that's sound advice. People should look out for opportunities and there are probably more opportunities than we realised because uh, people need a lot of reviewers by the number of papers being produced, yeah? Oh, tremendous. It's three, yeah. three or four reviewers now for top journals. Yeah. Um, thanks. I think we've just got a few minutes left, so I'm just going to... Um, there's, there's just a, a further reflection. Um, Richard picking up on this idea that um, we also, if we have all these emotions around the work we produce and the feedback we get, uh, Richard's reflecting how much also our students, uh, you can start to see how and empathise very closely with their own experience as we are the reviewers of their work. And I think that's a very good thought, you know, that actually as academics, we, we should put ourselves to the same test that we're also demanding uh, of our students. Is that something that again, uh, Gillian, you would, you can see the, the halves of it, as it were. Well, as a PhD supervisor, of course, I'm always giving feedback to my students and ultimately what we want these students to do is to have a good PhD experience, i.e. complete and with as few revisions as possible. So I think one always has to frame one's feedback within that uh, particular context. Um, I also would add that I think research informed teaching um, is, a, is a given, um, but really how students, how important it is 
for PhD supervisors where possible to be research active mm. where possible. And I think that's something that we should encourage. Absolutely, yeah. The, 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 bringing, the bringing together of, of that, of yeah. the research and the teaching. And well, it goes, it goes with this team building approach that we're working on at the moment. Definitely. I think that the theme of this, uh, br neatly brought together really, is that you know you have your different your different interests and your different skill sets. You can pursue a range of things. You probably need to pursue a range in order to move through things as some things get into different blocks or stages. And teamwork. Don't try and do it on your own. Never. Just don't. No, you might have to do a solo authored paper at some stage in your career just to show that you can. But it's very tough. And unless you really have to, I would, I would avoid it. Yeah. Work within teams. You can see it in the publications. Just yeah. And then bring that, bring that knowledge and that impact into, as you said, into the student learning and teaching experience and into the community practice yes, uh, around us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's, that, that's the way to uh, strengthen and build the teams. Thank you, Gillian. That's been lovely. Um, I think, Emma, uh, are we, are we in good time? Perfect timing. Thank you both. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I'm really sorry, actually, to have to, to draw it to a close here. It's been a, a really fascinating lecture. So thank you again to Gillian. Thank you. Um, and as you know, this is one of a series of events, so please do keep an eye on the website for further details. And I really hope you'll be able to join us for the, the next lecture in April, um, which will be delivered by Darren Kerr, who's our Head of um, Film and Digital Arts. So thank you all again for joining us and, and see, you, see you again soon. <laughs>